Amen. Father God, Lord, thank you, praise you for tonight. The honor of me speaking in your house. Lord, there's so many places around the world that you have to sneak around to go to church. But we thank the Lord that's not happening here at this point. So we ask, Father God, that you would just bless our fellowship together. May we find your iron sharpening iron tonight, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, help us, Lord, to understand the truth of your word. We ask, Lord, also that you take your servant hide behind the cross that only Jesus would be seen. And we want to pray for John tonight. Uh, his uh, sister-in-law passed away. They're having the viewing this evening. And uh, then tomorrow they're having the funeral. Please be with that family. Whoever is uh, officiating at the funeral, we ask that you give them the right words to speak to encourage the family and lord if there's one of those that does not know jesus as their lord and savior may this become a turning point in their life in the name of jesus we pray amen, amen. okay we're going to pick up where we left off last week <clears throat> if you have your your paper it's on the second sheet on the very top first page of the second sheet uh, where it says glorified. So uh, we want to welcome those that are watching at home. We ask that you just uh, where does it say for us? Get the Bible out if you haven't already. And uh, we're going to look at the first verse tonight. Will be Exodus twenty-eight forty-one. Exodus twenty-eight forty-one. Uh, we'll begin by saying that sanctified means being set apart. Now the thing is, if you're set apart from something, you have to go somewhere. For example, if you're set apart from lying, then you set apart to speak the truth. If you're set apart from unholiness, then you are set apart to holiness and righteousness. If you're separated or set apart from your sin, then you're set apart to living according to God's will in this way. Uh, there were many things in the Old Testament. Uh, there were things that uh, were considered holy or sanctified. And holy is one of the words that the... Uh, that comes from the same root as the word sanctified in the uh, Old Testament. So we find that in the Old Testament, uh, things were set apart for God's honor and use. One of those things was the, the priests. And here in Exodus 28, 41 says, And thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother and his sons with him, and shalt anoint them and consecrate them, and sanctify them that they may be, they may minister unto me in the priest's office. So he's talking about how the priests were to be anointed, they're be set apart. Uh, now there are those today that uh, have what they call the uh, the uh, priest of a Levitical priesthood. And the problem is they're Gentiles saying that they have men in their body, the religious body, who are part of the Levitical priesthood, which is kind of impossible because they're Gentiles. You have to be from uh, a descendant of Levi in order to be a priest in the Jewish temple. So uh, the whole family there, and I forget what age, do you remember what age they started ministering, Daniel? Oh, but I can tell you another thing. Today we know them. But Owen, Owen, Han, that surname, that last name, and also they're probably direct descendants of the Levites, even though they're in, the, in our era. Um, they would have that last name of Cohen or Khan or even Cowan. You're the end of time, so. What's a Levi? Did you say Cowan? Yeah, C O W A. Okay. Uh, when originally, when the uh, Israelites left Egypt, 
It started with Moses and his brother, Aaron, and his sister, Miriam. And Aaron was in charge of all of the priestly duties. Fast forward several generations down, when they got into the Promised Land 40 years later, the uh, tribe of Levi, there were uh, Israel, Jacob, who became Israel, had 12 children, all the way from Reuben to uh, Joseph and Benjamin. So when they got to the Promised Land, it was ended up being 12 tribes. One of, uh, um, actually kind of 13, but uh, 12 tribes of Israel. One of those tribes was the tribe of Levi, which is one of the children of Jacob slash Israel. And so if you were of the tribe of Levi, you put no lamb, you worked in the temple, and uh, you lived off of tithes and donations and sacrifices and stuff like that. So, um, and of course, then fast forward all these generations later, and uh, if you find somebody in last name of Cohen or Con, you know, James Con, the uh, uh, actor, he probably was of that tribe of Levi, that generation, and then Con as well. So you can still so spot them out in the wild, so to speak, and <laughs> walking around because of their last name. And what's it there, Con? Yes. Con, Cowan, Cohen, C O H E N. Oh, you know, when they when they cross the, uh, into the Holy Land, they built the tabernacle in the wilderness. And they camped around about it. And each tribe had their own section mm -hmm. where they were supposed to uh, dwell. And uh, they married within their own tribe. You know, a Levite man could only marry a Levite woman. And that was the way. Hey, they, cousin. Pardon? Hey, cousin. Hey, cousin. <laughs> yes. Welcome to Kentucky. Um, that was an inside joke. What's that? Oh, it's an inside joke. They'd all be cousins because they're all from the, the Levi. Yeah. But it, it was. Uh, about 400 years later. A large number of people. It just wasn't a village of 50 Four. people that Four. entered. Because when the Levi, or when the Israelites left um, Egypt, they took a census. There's about 1.2 million. And that was just the men. Huh? That was just the men. Yeah, it's not only the women in church. So 1.2 divided by 12 uh -huh. is 100,000 per tribe plus the women and children. But the... Um, the other interesting thing is when they, they had specific rules how to set up the tabernacle and so forth. And when you follow those rules from an aerial view, it's the shape of the cross with the tabernacle right where the beams cross. Oh. Pretty interesting. Yeah. And uh, my, <laughs> cool. I don't have a building computer, but you said there's one, approximately one and a half million. 1.2 million. 1.2 million. Okay. So that's 100,000 for each tribe. So then uh, if it had husband, wife, and children, <laughs> that's over 50,000. I mean, that's over 5 million people. Correct. Right. That crossed Plus or minus. over the river into yeah. the Holy Land. Yeah. And you can imagine. Yeah. Uh, what it's like I, now i don't know what to feed a family of a husband wife and four kids but i don't think i could organize that uh kmart shopping trip uh, to get enough groceries and i don't know what all they fed them but they survived they survived and they are still with us today i mean their descendants are so okay so Comprende? Yes. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to take a big shopping cart. Anyhow, so, uh, again, Exodus 28, 41 says, Then thou shalt put, put them upon Aaron thy brother and his sons with them, and shall anoint them and consecrate them, and sanctify them, that they may minister unto me 
in the priest's office. And their ministry was ministering to the Lord. You know, uh, we think we now come to the church that we want to be ministered to. But my Bible, and I have a, a loose uh, interpretation, you can take it or you can leave it. But uh, <laughs> the Bible says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings, wings of, of eagles, etc. And that word wait, it has a couple different meanings. Uh, one means to pause and be patient about for something like a kid waiting for Christmas morning so he can get his bicycle, and then he complains because uh, it's purple and he really wanted red. And then uh, the other thing is like when you all go into a sit-down restaurant, I'm sure, and you have a waiter or a waitress, and that person waits on you and your table, and they're there to minister to you. And like I said, this is a, a loose, I've never seen it written any place in any commentary or anything. And maybe it's there, I don't know. If I, if I write a commentary on that, it'll be there. The, the idea is that our job is to minister to the Lord. Uh, the waitress walks by and asks if you want another cup of coffee. Do you want another uh, beverage? Uh, how about dessert? They're taking care of our needs. And our Heavenly Father just needs to, he needs the fellowship with us. And we need to minister to him. And uh, when we do that, then we become stronger ourselves. And the reason being is that you are putting yourself last. You're putting yourself last and you're seeing that the Father has a greater importance in your life than you yourself. I was, I was taught this several years ago that uh, we are waiting on the Lord and not to say think of yourself more highly because you're not really all that great after all. Just trust in the Lord and minister to Him. Amen. Now we did a little rabbit trailing there. We need to get back on track. <laughs> so again, sanctify needs to be set apart. Exodus 29, 21. Oh, it didn't come on there, did it? No, nothing's come on. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to have to see what we can do about that. Where are your cables there? Exodus 29, 21? Yes. Hmm. Yeah. And yes. I was just following along in my Bible on the phone, and he said, "Well, we don't really need it." Anyway, so Exodus twenty-nine, twenty-one. You know, we're talking about the garments, the garments of the priests, the holy garments, and. That verse says, And thou shalt take of the blood that is upon the altar, and of the anointing oil, and sprinkle upon Aaron, upon his garments, and upon his sons, and upon the garments of his sons with him. And he shall be hallowed, and his garments, and his sons, and his sons' garments with him. So uh, we're set aside, uh, not only as an individual, but those things that we have in our life need to be dedicated to the Lord as well. You know, we, uh, some people have like 10 Bibles in their house and they're all like brand new. And they did set them aside to the shelf or the coffee table and not uh, uh, being utilized. But we are holy, at least we're supposed to be. be he said, be holy for I am holy. And then also, uh, we, that means that we are to be sanctified. And when people look at us, we should be a, re a reflection of Jesus Christ, a perfect reflection. Unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. So, excuse me, because I'm reading it, and it said they had to take blood 
and oils and throw it on their persons and their clothing. What was the blood from? Like a sacrifice? Yeah, it would be a lamb. Okay, okay. From a, from a lamb that, uh, Pash, what they call the Pasha lamb, is the one that during the feast of the Passover, that they would be anointed with that blood. And I'm gonna have some point then. Here's sponging all the blood on me and the oil. Well, uh, <laughs> it's pretty much like uh, some people that they they baptize by sprinkling. Yeah, okay. and, and, and in a sense, that's what they're doing. They're being anointed uh, okay. for for the ministry. And I remember when I was uh, first ordained that they 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 anointed me with oil in the name of Jesus and prayed over me and were setting me aside. To, from my worldly job to my job as a proclaim with the gospel of Jesus Christ as a pastor. It's more of a ceremony. Right. But it, it also lets the other believers know that this man has a responsibility and we need to honor not so much him as his office. Uh, sometimes we get carried away and we give more honor to the man than what he deserves. And I'll tell you what, I always said that I'm not perfect if you don't leave me as my wife and kids. But yet I have a, a, a calling. And it's very hard. You know, uh, old, old preachers don't die, they just give up the ghost. It's, I don't know a pastor who's truly retired. Or any answers because that burning and that calling is always on their heart. Uh, along that same thought, um, just to show you how serious it was that the only the Levites were allowed to do priestly duties, um, King Saul Amen. got impatient because Samuel was not there when he wanted to go to war and wanted to do some other things. So he went to the temple. And he performed the sacrifices, the priestly duties on behalf of Samuel. Did he have this poster? No, no. The king is the king. He's not the Levi oh. from the tribe of Levi. Mm -hmm. And so when Samuel finally got there, his donkey or whatever, he gave old King Saul a tongue lash. You shall not do that. That was us. That's how serious it was. That even the king of Israel was um, admonished penalized, tongue lashed, or even stepping into the temple to do. Tongue lash is throwing somebody off. But, uh, <laughs> yes, scolding. Scolding, yeah. Scolding, yeah. Like what a wife does to a husband when he comes home late. <laughs> and, uh, didn't he also lose his kingdom? I mean, it's, it's, you know, yeah, they were frowning eventually. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Also, he went and visited uh, fortune tellers, you know, yeah. a witch in a cave and the witch of it, I know. Yeah. So he ended up in the end it was all about King Saul and trying to well, keep keep his kingdom. Right. Not in uh, Right. It, it, it was a power struggle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what I learned from this from the story he's just told us is that we each have a place of ministry in the body of Christ. Um, Abby, she's a clerk in the office. She's the one that takes care, uh, makes sure that our bulletins are, and everything and all the stuff that we need is taken care of. She looks after the pastor. She takes his uh, messages. She's a, she's a secretary. And that does not mean she's the janitor. She's the secretary. Uh, the pastor is the pastor, and we need to let him do his job. And I had a, a real hard time. I know a lot of people don't think that uh, women should be preachers. And I had a hard time dealing with that because I knew my wife had a calling on her life. And I knew that um, she'd probably do better than me. And so, I really had a hard time of yielding my, my pulpit, the pulpit, to her. But one day, uh, I was working at, I was working out of patrol on the side because the church wasn't big enough to uh, pay us a salary. And so uh, 
I come to, to the church to service one Wednesday night in my uniform after I had just cleaned out the pound. Oh, God. And I smell like the pound. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, man, that's not right for me to be standing up there sharing a word like this. And because I knew we, uh, you're supposed to put your best part for it. You know, it, pastor, when he preaches, he always wears a suit coat and, and a tie mm-hmm. because he is putting his best foot forward for the Lord. But I noticed that if he's not preaching, uh, if someone else is, then he'll sit down there and he won't have a tie on. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you ever noticed, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so can I say one thing along that line? Not about the pastor, but about women preachers. Yeah. Uh, two things. The first person that Jesus revealed his Messiah ship to, the woman at the well, Amen. who had been married and divorced five times. And she immediately went to her village and she preached the gospel. You know, I never thought of it that way. Being a woman, I thought of it. You, he, 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 because like we, we got big mouths as women. We're going to go tell everybody. That's not the way I look at it. Right. I'm serious. Yeah, the way like, I, like, oh, I saw Jesus. I, I saw Jesus. I like it a little differently. All, <laughs> all the men in the town knew who she was. You know? <laughs> she was the town trip. Exactly. And they would listen to her. Right. All the women in the town gossiped about her. Mm-hmm. So, so he thought to the men her. So he was pretty. And the men rejected his message. Then it would go nowhere. If he went to the women's church, they were second class citizens. But by selecting the woman at the well and doing it in the way that he did, he said he was married five times and the man who went to the not your other. That's the right person for that village because all the men would listen to her. <laughs> and, <eventually laughs> and, and it also set the entire village. He also gave, gave their life to Christ. Now, the second thing is, when he uh, had risen from the grave, it was a woman, as in Mary, mm-hmm. who discovered it, and she ran back to the upper room. He said, go back to the disciples and tell them, tell them that I have risen. There's the gospel again. He had risen. So, the third message is, in the prophecies of the Old Testament, it says, in the end time, I will pour out my spirit upon men and women. So if you are, like you're talking about, you're stuck in the mud die that says women can't preach, then you're in defiance of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And you need to get your theology straightened out. You need to go read the Bible and get in line with God. Because he says, prophesies and says, I will pour out my spirit on men and women. So but, women but, Excuse me, but isn't there a difference between preaching and being a leader? A pastor. Like a pastor? Yeah. yeah. I know women can preach, that's, that's but, but, but I, will, I won't follow a woman. I mean, because no, we're pretty yeah. emotional. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the distinction. Um, you'll listen to Joyce Meyer preach and all that. But when they try to uh, in, uh, install a woman as a pastor, then it can be problematic. That's like putting a, a woman to be a president. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's a loose that. analogy, but I won't get into it. But you can imagine a, a woman is a pastor, mm-hmm. and she's trying to counsel a 25-year-old young man mm-hmm. who's dealing with marital problems. Mm-hmm. It's like your grandma telling you know, yeah. it ain't gonna work. And I, and, you know, that's like quick to the point. But that's why it, I, I would. Okay, Timothy, it says that uh, pastors should be men. Preachers, yes, women. But pastors, men, because they lead the uh, shepherd of the flock. Mm-hmm. And you can get into some sticky situations. If the head of the church, the congregation, is a woman, and uh, so forth. Yeah. So in the Bible, when they refer to, like, everything is referred to man, man, man. Are they meaning sometimes women, or is it just the word? Well, some sometimes, sometimes the word man is really man should be man. translated man. 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 So including both genders, yeah. but it was a matriarch or, or a patriarchal society right. in those days. So 
uh, there are a lot of stick in the buds. But to get back what I'm saying, earlier, trying to say, was I a hard time releasing my wife to fulfill her ministry? And the truth of the matter is, I had no right to do that, even though I was a pastor of the church. I need to lose her. And I'll tell you something, when I did that, First, I got a little more red starting with me. <laughs> Second, uh, that the ministry of our church increased. And uh, she still active, although we're not married now. She's still active in ministry. And she has, uh, she leads uh, women's retreats. She leads women's Bible studies. Uh, and our son leads a Bible study in the home. And she had a dynamic ministry. And then when uh, tragedy struck, and I won't get into all that, but when she went through some hard times, the Lord was there and raised her up. And then she would, she's wrote a book about it. And she's gone into several churches but upon the invitation to share her testimony as to how the Lord had been using her and how that what she was from the natural point, was a tragedy. The Lord took it and turned it around. You know, the enemy is the one who attacks us. Our Heavenly Father doesn't do that. He doesn't attack us. He doesn't uh, put cancer on our bodies. He's not the one that causes a divorce in our home. It's the enemy, and we don't want to give him too much credit. Because lots of times it's just people not being yielded to working in the Holy Spirit in their own lives. And if they're not leading the, allowing the Holy Spirit to take reign in their own lives, then uh, whoever they're trying to lead, they're going to have the same problem. Because uh, they grow up to be like us. I say that that's what it is with our kids. There's only one thing wrong with kids. They grow up to be like their parents. Mm -hmm. So if their parents aren't dedicated to the Lord, Nine times out of ten, the kids will not be dedicated, Lord, because they will replicate whatever they see their parents doing. So if uh, the father is uh, a wife abuser, whether it's physically or emotionally, uh, then the son learns, well, that does it, so it's okay. So he's going to treat his wife with the same disrespect. But I just praise the Lord that when I... Uh, turn my wife loose, that my life changed as I saw what the Lord did to, uh, did through her and so forth. So, praise the Lord. Again, mm -hmm. we're rabbit trail. <laughs> okay. So, we found that not only was the men, the men were sanctified, but the dark, holy garments that they had. And there are certain garments that you wear in the temple, but they didn't wear out on the street. Just like uh, for the Passover and so forth, uh, the Orthodox Jew today has two sets of dishes. One is just for Passover. The other is for regular meals. And they don't mix them up. They don't mix them up. Anyhow, yeah, something's wrong here. So the, the garments, and then the next thing is in Exodus thirty, chapter, uh, chapter thirty, verse ten. And someone read that for us, please. However, Aaron shall make atonement on its horns once a year. He shall make atonement on it with the blood of the sin offering of atonement once a year throughout your generation. It is most holy to the Lord. Amen. Uh, the altar. Now, we have an altar in, in our church. Uh, some call it the communion table. But that's like an altar and it carries the, the sacraments for communion. Uh, and we're not supposed to take those things lightly. We're supposed to have respect to those things. And uh, the Antichrist uh, 
is going to endeavor to uh, do a sacrifice in the temple, and it's going to be rejected. And we need to be sanctified. So those things that we do will bring glory and honor to the Lord. Then Exodus 29, 21. Someone read that for us. You mean the holy garments again? Oh. Yeah, we just, yeah. The next one's the holy lamb, Leviticus 27, 21. Okay, we did the priest and oh I'm not pressing the wrong button on the back. Leviticus? Yes, Leviticus. Okay. So it's the holy land. Leviticus twenty seven twenty one. Tito, can you read that for us? Leviticus twenty seven twenty one. I can locate it, sir. It's in the old testament. I am aware of that. Okay. <laughs> Just a little slow, sir. 27 31. 27 21. Yeah. Or? You think it just turned off? But the field, when it goeth out in the Jubilee, shall be holy unto the Lord. That's a field that devoted. The possession thereof shall be the priests. Amen. So the land itself, matter of fact, we still refer to Israel today as the holy land. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a special place that the Lord has uh, set aside to show forth his glory to his people. Uh, and I, I don't like war, but I think we need to support the nation of Israel because they, God, the Bible says that those who bless Israel, the Lord will bless. So we, we need to minister to Israel. And I'll tell you, he's talking here about when a person purchases a people, is that what I understand? Going back to uh, 17. We're going to look at 17. If he sacrifices the field from the year of Jubilee, according to the ASMS estimations, it shall, be, it shall stand. Is it referring to when an individual? Because, you know, But I understand that year of Jubilee was when all bids were canceled, right? Every 50th year. Yeah. yeah, which was every 50 years in the year of Jubilee. And so, is it, is it talking about when, when the field, the land, in other words, if a Jew needed land or uh, needed money for some purpose, he was having a hard time, we might talk. This field to a brother or somebody, some relative, right? For money. And then, of course, at the, when the, the year of Jubilee arrived, that land returned to him. Right. Is that what it's referring to? Yes, here? it is. And that uh, year of Jubilee is every 50 years. 50 years, right? right. But when it says right here, the, the 21, verse 21. But the field, is that what it's referring to? But the field, when it goeth out in the Jubilee, shall be holy unto the Lord as a field of devoted. The position thereof shall be the priests. And what verse was that? 21. 27. 27. 27, 21. Leviticus 27. Verse 21. Well, while you're trying to figure out that, I have a friend who just retired on Tuesday at the AJE from business. And he had a practice that every time business got slow, he would make a donation to Israel. 
he would find some organization in Israel to jumpstart his business and get going. And, and he made a life practice of that because of that verse that says, Anyone who blesses Israel, I will bless. Anyone who curses Israel, I will curse. So, right. Even if it was only 50 bucks, he would yeah, so make 50 bucks. To so our wonderful prince, and that's the game you gave him a First, who is Cersei? There you go. There you go. There you go. Not desiring to be political, but we really need to support Israel. Right? And realize that there's some great things yet to come out of that nation. Well, well historically, biblically, if you do not support Israel, you do it at your own peril. <laughs> amen. Everybody said amen. Yeah. And they call it. 67 day war, the 73, or the 67 war, six day war, I think it was 73, that war, every time Israel got more land. So yeah. if you don't support Israel, you, you do it at your own peril. And I told you about that. I was to return to be his story for me, for the Air Force, when that war got started. <laughs> and they said, no, he can't go out. He can't. And can't be discharged. Right. So we need to be careful how we we deal with the sacred things, that, whether it's land or the uh, leadership that's been set aside. Uh, we don't have to agree with everybody about everything, but the the essentials we need to is to how who God is. Well. It's true, but you know, the thing is, it's, it is true that what the Lord says, he who blesses Israel will be blessed, okay? Because when Israel first got started in 1948, they had one claim, a few old weapons, and they were attacked by all their, their neighbors, and they whipped them. <laughs> Amen. And, uh, and they were not allowed, the Jews were not allowed to own weapons at that time. No, they had the old weapons and the yeah. British left behind. Yeah, and so uh, I read somewhere, I remember reading it, that because they were not allowed to own weapons, that they took broom handles, and hoe handles, <laughs> and stuck them out as if there were guns, where they couldn't see the whole thing. But... Uh, when certain individuals saw what appeared to be an army, they were a little more reluctant to mess with Israel. And that's how they survived their first day, because they were all, both their enemies were around, that as soon as Britain was leaving, uh, that they were going to go in and destroy the nation. But it hasn't happened. They've been trying to destroy uh, Israel, since it, way back when, 48 and I think about 60, I remember my brother was called in, it's 60, 60 or something, 65 I think it was, and then in 73 and then, I mean, uh, 67 and then in 73, four times they have tried to take Israel, yeah. all those countries, and four times they've lost in Israel, that's got to make <laughs> And then we find Hamas has just tried the same thing, and they haven't learned. You know, the saying is, if we keep doing the same thing over and over again, we're going to have the same results. Okay. Now, so, uh, moving on. We need to declare that we are not trying to grow towards sainthood. It's not, some, it's not something that uh, you have to become. Because once you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, you already can, in God's eyes, you're already considered the same. Second Peter three eighteen says, "But grow." That's the operative word. Grow in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So we need to grow in grace. It's a daily process. I don't know about you, uh, but for me, knowing my, knowing my own life, 
I know I haven't reached perfection yet. Some of you might think you have, but uh, I don't think so. So Second Peter again, 3.18 says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and the Savior Jesus Christ. Where, where, do you, where do we get the knowledge? What is it talking about? Where do, what knowledge is it talking about? It's the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But you know, if we are to be holy as he is holy, then they, we need to study the Word of God and see the example that he set for us. Uh, I always said, you know, everything the Lord required of us, everything Jesus required of us, he set the example. Even paying his taxes. He paid his taxes. And we, I know sometimes the taxes got high, especially on, on uh, gasoline, but, well, <laughs> Be another rabbit trip. So, so I'm, I'm a growing saint. Second Corinthians ten fifteen. Someone read that for us, please. Which one? Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians ten fifteen. Neither do we go beyond our limits by boasting of work done by others. Our hope is that as your faith continues to grow, our sphere of activity among you will greatly expand. Amen. So, as we grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our faith will increase. You know, uh, I was part of the system at one time that if you didn't like what was going on, you could file a complaint. And uh, your complaint, though, just couldn't be saying, well, the reason I don't like that, and this goes blah, blah, blah. But if you know what the rules are, and you quote the rules, then you have a basis to make your complaint. You need to be able to refer to the Word of God. We cannot claim something that is not promised to us. But God has made all kinds of promises in, the, in His Word, and those are the things that we need to claim. And I was told, uh, when I was first in Bible college, I had a, a roommate, this guy was a 4.0 uh, student in the University of Oregon Honors College. And so, he was pretty smart. He had a tremendous memory, almost photographic. And, but he taught me, Brother Jim, this is what you need to do. You need to pray, but base your prayer on the Word of God. He says, pray the Bible. And I don't mean this disrespectfully when I say this, but in a sense, when we're seeking the Lord, we should need kind of throw His Word back into His face. Mm -hmm. uh, I do, that happens with my kids. I would say, okay, if we get better grades and report cards when they come out, we're going to go for pizza. So again, they get better grades on, the re on their report card, and they come to me and say, well, Dad, let's go for pizza. And I might either jokingly or seriously <laughs> say, no, we're not going to do that. But they say, but Dad, you said. You said. And I like what Billy Graham does or did. He always says, it's in the book. It's written. In other words, he wasn't speaking on his own authority. He was speaking on what the Word of God says. And when we go to the Lord in prayer, uh, for example, uh, you have a need. He says that he will supply all of our need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So we can claim that as a promise, uh, whether it, the need is a healing or a financial or emotional, uh, a new ha new home, uh, a roof on, on our home, or whatever. We can, those are things that we need in our lives, and we can claim them. Now, we need to be very careful. There was a, a group 
out there called naming claimants. Right. They would name their own thing and claim their own thing. Uh, I won a Mercedes Benz. <laughs> and the Lord says, you know, you really just need a Ford. <laughs> Unless you live in Germany and then a Mercedes Benz is just a Ford. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there are taxi cabs over there. They are. Taxi cabs. Uh, yeah. when, I, when I say that to every, every pastor that brings that up, as I say, it's always a thing. Jesus said, ask anything in my name. Well, a temple is. A temple is. No, no, no. Ask anything in my name. That's all he said. Now, you have. Faith to ask for it, go for it, whether it's a Mercedes Benz or not. In other words, don't get trapped up because the minute man starts putting limits on it, then we won't even ask him, well, that guy really doesn't deserve salvation because he killed two people. We don't ask for it. And you start limiting it, right? And Jesus never limited it. He said, ask anything in my name, and I shall give it. I shall go to the Father, and he shall give it to you. He may give it to you. And the word may there, it's not may or may not. It's may as in that gives him permission to give it to you. Uh, but in that, in that instance of the word may means he may give it to you, in other words, because... On his you, time. Well, that's true. Because it says, and he, and he will, when he talks about cursing a fig tree, then he turns around and says, you could say to this mountain, be cast into the sea, and it will be. But it talks in its own time. But people say, well, I don't need a mountain. No, but maybe you need a larger house. Well, you should be humble and be satisfied with what you have. Jesus said, ask anything in my name. Sometimes it's just a matter of making your faith stronger. It's not a matter of material things. Um, another thing I want to say real quick along that same line was, Two verses in the Bible where he said, uh, ask, uh, throw it back in Dad's face, so to speak. God said in the Old Testament that like the rain that falls from heaven to the earth and returns to the clouds, my word will not go, will return to me, will not return to me void. In other words, he speaks his word, we know what his word is, and then it comes back to him and it will not return void. In other words, it will not return without having done what his word said it would do. Well, how does it return? Our mouth, our lips make it return to him. And the other thing is, he uh, says, he, he uh, and his word, I'd have to look the verse up, but he specifically says, remind me of what I said. Well, the only way you know what he said is to read his word. Mm. He said, remind me of what Amen. I said. Yes. So if you take his void, his word won't be returned to him void. It'll accomplish what it was set to do. And he says, "Tell me what I said." He's encouraging. Then you add to that with Jesus. Ask anything in my name. In other words, let me decide when and where. But ask anything and don't limit me. Don't limit God. My, I'm half facetious, but. The first Mercedes I ever rode in was a taxi cab in Europe. It's a cab. Yeah. Over there, it's no big deal. Yeah. But the fact that we have import fees, we all of a sudden turn the Mercedes into, ooh, this big thing. Over there, it's just a transportation. Yeah. Let me give you an illustration. Uh, yeah. I had a, had a girlfriend years ago. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, we took a bus with this. She was going. <laughs> she was going to go visit the mission field, and she didn't have any luggage, so she needed a luggage. She needed a suitcase, and so she's walking down the street in Los Angeles. I forget what street it was. It's irrelevant for the sake of the illustration, but she saw a luggage store, and she saw a suitcase. And it was the sense of Lord pointing that suitcase out to her. It was big enough to take her needs, her clothing and toiletries and so forth, to uh, Bottom Colombia, Bar yeah, and then Colombia, Barranquilla, Colombia, and uh, 
But when she went to buy, she was quickened in her spirit. Is it the Lord said, that's the two case you need, but this is not the place to buy it. She walked down to the next block, and there was another luggage store with the exact same suitcase for about $20 cheaper. Mm -hmm. you know, so we need to be careful that the Lord is leading us and guiding us in everything in our life. Uh, we have this problem with some young couples are so anxious to get married. Uh, they uh, look at a blonde. I can only say this for men because I don't know what they threw a woman's mind. I would try, try to even uh, read a woman's mind because uh, usually they're black. But, uh, and they see a, a woman, she, she's good looking, uh, she's great with kids, and she may even have a little bit of money. And she's got the cutest smile and can walk. And they might say, that is the woman for me. Where are we going with this? I know, you're going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And uh, yeah. they, end up, yeah. Yeah. they yeah. end up getting married. And their marriage, it was the wrong woman to begin with because there were things about her that he didn't know. And he had to really pray about. I'm thinking of a particular mm -hmm. couple, and it's not me and my wife, but it's a uh, it's, it's, there's another verse that as Samuel was sharing about asking in, in the name of Jesus uh, that and that means by the authority of Jesus mm -hmm. and what he has said and on his, based on his word but we need to know the Bible says ask what every will that you ask anything anything According to my will, I will hear you. And if I hear you, you know that you have the petitions you desire of me. But we need to know God's will. And say, is this the one? Is that the one? It's like that sh show me the Carfax. Let me ask you a question, and this is an actual. Should I ask God for a new roof? For what? For a new roof, even though I don't need one, and I want it free. I want it to be free. Should I ask God for a new roof, and I don't want to pay for it? What do you think? I did that two years ago, and guess what I got? A new roof? Got a brand new roof, and I don't have to pay for it. Yeah. What? I also asked God for free solo, and guess what I got? Because I believe that works. It said, ask anything. And so I asked anything. I made up a wish list. If I were to show you my bridge and you see what's on there, it wouldn't stand the test of man. Mm. But I believe Jesus. And lo and behold, mm. I got a free roof and I got a free soul. Yeah. Because I believe that verse, I took Jesus. Amen. Amen. And, and so, I, so in my own, this other one, if you ask anything according to my will, so, so the Bible is a guru for Daniel in his book. <laughs> you know, see, you get trapped when you, when you, when you, man starts putting conditions on God's word. We get in trouble. That's right. Do what God said to do. Remind me what I said. And let the chips fall where they may. I'm going to talk to that thing down to repair my kidneys, yeah. and, but I know if I'm his time, but I hope it's his time before my time's out. Okay, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. You were here when we prayed for John, right? It, yeah. And his blood clot was, and he went back to the doctor and they couldn't yeah. find it after class right now. We have that answer. And we're not afraid of you. Amen. Ask anything in my name. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but it also says where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there and miss them. Yeah. So uh, I pray for things of my own, oh. but there's sometimes where I ask Mary to pray with me, or you know, you do it in a group setting. So right it. after class, we're going to pray for you. All right. Thank okay. you. Uh, and then we're going to let God take care of it. It's not Daniel, it's God. Yeah. If you 
got a roof, I know things. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's let's take these next couple uh, of minutes to get right back on our lesson. There are two focuses of sanctification. Sanctification refers to two things. One is this finished action of being made holy, so that when we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior, it's the Bible says that he, it's not, the, it's not a direct quotation, but he lays his holiness on him, on us. In other words, it's his holiness, he's declared us to be holy because he's cleansed us from our sin, he's cleansed us and, uh, from the penalty of our sin. It, like someone said, it's as if we've never did whatever that was. And so, uh, it's a finished thing. Jesus said at the cross, it's finished. And so there's nothing we can do. And listen real close to this. There's nothing we can do that can make us holy. Being holy is what causes us to do some of the righteous things that we do. Because our nature has changed. So when he comes into our life, he changes us. And I, I like my, my grandsons, they used to wear those bracelets, and I ran across one just uh, yesterday in, in a box of junk. I've got WWJD, what would Jesus do? Mm -hmm. And if we put that thought first, all right, what would the Lord do in this situation? Well, is there an example in the Bible? Is there a verse that you can stand on? Is there a promise of God's word? Then give it back to him and say, okay. But we cannot... It says, it's not of works lest any man should boast. That it deals with our entire salvation package. None of the promises that God has for us is based on what we do. It's like he says, like Daniel says, it's what God said. Remind him. He says, test, test me. When it comes to prototyping, for example, he said, he'll give us return to his press down, shaking together and running over. And I did not know what that meant one day until I bought some canisters. And I, well, one says coffee on it. So I went and got a can of coffee. And I tried to pour the canister. Wait a minute. It wouldn't hold it all. So what I had to do, I had to press it down, get tap the, the side of the can, and first thing you know, I got it all in and a little room to spare. So it, he's going to modify our capacity to receive the blessings he has for us. Then it's a daily process of becoming holy. It's a, it's a growth process. Listen, when you plant carrot seeds on Monday, don't expect the harvest of carrots on Tuesday. There's a process that seed has to go through that it will sprout. And first thing you know, a little bit of green will stick out of the soil. And first thing you know, if you're patient and water it and weed it, take good care of it like we should with our spiritual life, then you're going to have carrots. Mm -hmm. But you know, sometimes we're thinking we're, we're doing everything that's right. And I have uh, this little garden outside of my bedroom, and it was like about six foot long. And, three foot deep, and I planted some things in there, and I thought I did everything right, but nothing happened. Oh, there's a little green here, a little green there, but I never got a harvest. And the Lord spoke to me, says, all right, do it all over. Plant it again. And so I planted it again. I had the nicest carrots. I had the biggest hardest radishes I have ever eaten, and I had the tallest, sweetest corn. You know, it's just a little bit of everything to make a salad out of you know, lettuce, tomatoes. But when he told me to replant it, he says, what you see happening in your garden is what's going to happen to the church that you're pastoring. Mm -hmm. He says, I'm going to reseed it. It's going to flourish. And the last time I was in Sanger, I went to the paint store, 
and felt some pain, and uh, I was no longer the pastor there. And uh, the guy who ran the paint shop says, Brother Jim, you know something? He says, I know all the struggles that church has had down through the years, but right now, that church is the church to go to. The Lord blessed it, and they ended up with all kinds of ministry to inmates and uh, prison ministries and halfway houses, and guys are getting saved right and left, so to speak. But when the Lord does it, and we just follow his instructions, and part of that instruction is, Chip, I have my own timing. I think you said something about timing earlier. Somebody was heard it. Anyhow, he has his timing. You see, when we pray, we know what we, we need and what we want. And we don't always get it when we ask for it. Careful. Hear what I have to say. But what the Lord is saying, not right now, just like this young lady's suitcase, go down the street. The one you really want is down there. The, the spouse that you want, you haven't met him or her yet, but you will. Be obedient. Follow my direction in your life, and I'll bring the two of you together. We can't work it on our own. We need it based on the Word of God, and we need to know then that He'll sanctify our marriage or relationships or whatever it is we're praying about. And we're going to close right here. <laughs> we still haven't finished this section. There, there's about 12 more slides that we need. So uh, hold on to those outlines and we'll get into it then next week where we will finish this. So uh, let's pray and uh, we'll tell the folks at home, God bless you. We'll see you next week and uh, pray for us. Amen.